All right, what's going on? This is the QTR Podcast Tax Day Edition, kind of. It's almost tax day. How the hell is everybody? Doing good? Everybody promptly turning over uh, half their income to the government so we can immediately wire it to Ukraine and various art dealers for Hunter Biden's artwork and what else are we spending money on? I don't know, but I just saw Jamie Raskin in front of Congress call Ivermectin horse dewormer again. (laughs) We're gone. How useless can one politician be? How can you fucking sit in front of Congress right now and say, and say with a straight face, be think first off, I know of an, I know enough about ivermectin to comment on it. And then your first comment is, I believe it's an animal dewormer. Like we haven't fucking been talking about it for like how blind to any facts at all. This is what happens when you don't do any research and your staffers just bring you your talking points on a sheet of paper. You would have to live in a goddamn cave. Even if you're a far left Democrat and you are against ivermectin, you would need to be on Mars to not understand that it's also a human medicine, let alone a Nobel Prize winning one. But Jamie Raskin sitting up there in front of Congress, uh, I believe it's a, I believe it's a, 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 a dewormer. I believe it's an animal dewormer. Is that what you believe? Fucking useless. Anyways, that's besides the point. That was just a quick uh, aside. This podcast, like all of my podcasts, brought to you by my patrons. Patrons are people that sign up on Patreon, donate a monthly recurring sum to help support the podcast. I'm going to shout them out, and we will get started with my buddy Mark Spiegel in a second. First and foremost, I want to shout out my exclusive gold and silver providers over at JM Bullion. I know known JM Bullion for uh, years now. They have been in business for over a decade. They've done over $7 billion in sales. They always have great inventory. They ship discreetly. Uh, their premiums are manageable, and they're generally great people to work with. And by the way, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that gold is at a new all-time high yet again. So every time over the past 10 years that everybody has called you a crackpot or an idiot or a conspiracy theorist or a moron for saying you should buy gold, every single time you've said you should buy gold, you're in the green right now. Effective today, gold has never been higher, and so that means that any time you've bought it, you're in the green. And that is... I would say a pretty good track record. People be like, well, what is it versus the S&P? Well, what is it on a fucking log scale? Well, what is it versus inflation? Hey, go fuck yourselves, all right? Green is green, and that's the way it works. And you're going to see some real shit here now that the Fed's back into a corner. We're only getting started, all right? Wait till you start seeing three, four, five hundred dollar an ounce moves overnight. Anyways, if you are interested in buying gold and silver bullion, email Laura, L-A-U-R-A at jmbullion.com. She's there exclusively for QTR podcast listeners, and I just absolutely love and trust JM Bullion. Please give them a shout if you're in the bullion, uh, if you're in the market for some gold and silver bullion, and who shouldn't be? This podcast also brought to you by my friends over at Rebel Capitalist Pro. My friend George Gammon has teamed up with Chris McIntosh, Lynn Alden, and people like Brent Johnson to help bring you Numerous ways to help preserve your wealth in a world of -of out-of-control central banks. I've noticed George starting some shit on Twitter recently, talking about uh, kind of almost taking an anti-gold stance. Uh, And that's why I like him. You know, he's able to articulate himself well. He brings arguments to the table that not a lot of other people have, despite seeing the central bank Ponzi scheme for what it is like the rest of us do. Uh, George always has a different take on things, and that's why I love reading his forums, watching his live free videos on his Rebel Capitalist and George Gammon channels. Reach out to George if you want to try Rebel Capitalist Pro. I think it's worth it. You get access to premium research from people like Lynn Alden and Brent Johnson. You get all their live Q&As. You get mock portfolios, things like that. For me, I think it's well worth it. Shoot George a message. Tell him you heard uh, on the QTR podcast that he would give you a free trial. And uh, I'm sure he will because he's a damn good guy like that. George Gammon, love you. Link is in the podcast description. And finally, my only Bitcoin sponsor, probably forever. This is it. I'm riding with, with, it's a ride or die, I think, with Swan for me. But uh, my friends over at Swan, 
which is really, I think, the best way to buy Bitcoin. It helps you buy Bitcoin on a recurring basis. You can set it and forget it, like the fucking road time, uh, Ronco Showtime Rotisserie Grill. Remember those infomercials? He said how much you want to buy on a daily or weekly basis. Um, the app does the rest for you. There's nothing to think about. Um, I know the people over at Swan. I've talked to them extensively. As much as, you know, the, the, and, and I've said this before, there is risk in Bitcoin. Uh, I don't allocate to Bitcoin the way I do with gold, but that's just me personally. But I think if Bitcoin is going to make it, then Swan are the people I want to be riding with. Um, and so that may be a little bit more of a conservative stance than they would like me to say, but I have to be honest with my listeners also. I like Swan, though. I like the people involved over there. My friend Larry Lepard's involved over there. My friend uh, James Lavish, I think, is involved over there. Lynn Alden, I know, I think, sits on the board of directors over there. So at least, at the very least, I can do is vet the company and vet the people involved, though I can't tell you what Bitcoin is going to do. Look, the Swan app, you can start buying in about two minutes. There's no fees on your first $10,000 that you buy now, which is insane. Uh, you're not going to find anywhere else that's doing that. I don't think Robinhood or Coinbase or any of those people are doing that. So you can go in, buy $10,000 worth of Bitcoin uh, with no fees. And the way to do that is to go through my link because you immediately get $10 in Bitcoin free. And that link is in my podcast description. So if you want to give Swan a try, Use my link. If you want to give JM Bullion a try, email Laura at uh, jmbullion.com. And if you want to, uh, if you want to bother George Gammon, just figure out a way to bother him and tell him that I sent you. <laughs> I do like uh, I do like Swan. Maybe we'll talk some Bitcoin with Mark. We'll see what kind of mood he's in. I'm guessing we'll probably talk some Tesla. Let me get this guy on the line here, and we're going to get started. Oh, by the way, I'm not an investment advisor. This is not investment advice. I hold no licenses, no registrations. You should generally be doing your research elsewhere. I don't have much of a clue as to what I'm talking about. You should read all pertinent disclosures and disclaimers. There's a bunch of them on my Substack. stack tell you just exactly how big of an idiot I am so that you can wrap your head around it before taking in the information that is contained herein. How's that for a legal disclaimer? All right. All right, I have uh, from Stanfield Capital, my friend Mark Spiegel. How are you today, sir? My my long uh, long standing returning champion to the show here. <laughs> it's uh, it's great to be back on this show. It's uh, it's really quite an honor, considering. Is it? You know, well, you don't do these shows that often anymore, and uh, I think you're a funny guy. You crack me up. Um, you know, sort of out of left field, good stuff. So yeah, I'm happy to be here for sure. I do like, I do. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I forgot to mute my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm honored to be here. Excuse me. I've got to take this call. I mean, <laughs> that was my psychiatrist calling, asking what the fuck I'm doing on this podcast. No. I, I, I cut him off. All right, good. Yeah, you can get back to him afterwards. What's what? We'll get we'll get some uh, we'll get you some good trauma here over the next hour, so you have some things to discuss. <laughs> yeah. Listen, um, first off, yeah, no, I'm only doing about two shows a month, but I like it like that. You know, my thing is like, at some point, I start thinking, am I repeating? the same guest, but I, you know, I just don't care. When I started in 2018, I wanted to talk to the people I wanted to talk to. When I lose interest in people, I stop talking to them. When I find interest in new people, like I'm trying to get this dude, James Lavish on, uh, soon, super smart guy. My, this dude, uh, Harris Kupperman, I'm trying to get on also too, you know, then I, I bring on some new people. So there'll be some new people coming on, but I'm dude, I'm always happy to have you on because it is, it's always interesting discussing the Tesla saga and, Let's just get right into it because I, I want to talk macro too. I read your letter every month that you publish it, um, and there's a lot to say on macro. But let's just start on Tesla. I mean, the year has been a, a nightmare, and I know because on my blog, uh, I put shorting Tesla as like one of my 24 ideas for the year. Um, you know, I really think that we peaked out. I think late 2022, early 2023. Way too many bullets still in the air for this dude to dodge. And so far this year, it, it looks like things have just collapsed uh, in terms of sentiment, in terms of um, everything operationally, in terms of his inability to, you know, <clears throat> finesse his way out of situations by lying generally. What's, what I find interesting now is this $170 level. So let's just get right in and talk to that. I mean, given the news that we've seen over the last 
month or two, right? The, uh, the operations are crumbling. Q1 was a huge delivery miss. He has all of this exogenous regulatory risk still out there. He's now put himself and his team in the fire with needing to come up with something other than a dancing robot in a human suit or a <laughs> dancing human in a robot suit on, on August 8th, right? Because he lied about having humanoid robots and he put together nothing. Now he's trying to position himself as an AI company. I mean, it just feels like the wheels should be falling off far more than they are. And is that – what is that? What the hell is keeping the stock at $170 a share right now? Well – I mean, there are two possible explanations because I don't think I don't think any fundamental institutional investors are getting long this thing at this point. Um, I mean, there might be some who are, who still hold it, who believe, but there's no new ones coming in. Uh, one possible explanation is just massive uh, worldwide retail buying, you know, right. India, Korea, Germany, you know, just just massive. Right. Um, and then the other possible explanation is somebody uh, is illegally uh, propping up the stock through options uh, with an offshore account. And, and, you know, now you might ask, well, who would spend millions and millions of dollars to do that? And I mean, it might be somebody who had tens of billions worth of the stock, but I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, you think that's happening? I don't know. I mean, who the hell knows? I, it, it's absolutely uncanny. Uh, what happens with this stock, right? I mean, anyone who's observed this for a long time knows when really bad news hits, miraculously, a bid shows up, right? Now, we know for a fact that there is not a security law under the sun uh, that Elon Musk would not happily violate. I, I mean, there's a lot of other laws he happily violates, too. So, but do I have any proof of that? No. Am I accusing him of that? No. I'm saying that it's something that, for sure, uh, if we had an SEC that gave a shit about anything but climate change and, you know, um, finding investment banks for people texting at each other, it's something that should be looked at. But, you know, so far, this guy still seems to have regulatory immunity, you know, notwithstanding the fact that the Wall Street Journal said the DOJ had convened a grand jury to, talk, you know, with with an investigation going on last fall. But we've heard nothing since then, and that was like what six months ago or something. So, it's it's there's what there's no explanation. I mean, look at look at the stuff with NHTSA. I mean, any other car, not just the autopilot and full self driving crap, but any other car that had the steering lock and the random slamming on the brakes on the highway, which I guess sort of is autopilot, and uh, and you know a bunch of unexplained charging battery fires. If the manufacturer didn't voluntarily do the recall, which a number of them have with similar incidents, then the NHTSA would step in and do it. But it's this, this we've been talking about this story for as long as I've known you, right? Which is eight years or something. He just, yeah. you know, he, for whatever reason. Look, you know, they, people say, well, he's got the defense contracts. They want the spy satellites. Listen, if you got a contract with SpaceX, fuck him. You got a contract with SpaceX. He could go to fucking jail. And, and SpaceX has to honor the contract, and I assume its investors would want it to honor the contract. And he's, you know, he just shows up for the rocket launches there and, and some other, I mean, he has hands-on people running that company. That's the only reason the goddamn rockets get up in the air in the first place. Yeah, the, well, ones he's in, the one he's involved with is probably, the, is that, he, he, is the one that keeps blowing up. <laughs> the idea that he is this, and we talked about this on a private email chain that me and you have, with a couple people, but the idea that he is running around and is this super busy guy. I and mean, he's like so revered. Every time he goes on a podcast, people are like SpaceX, Tesla, the boring <laughs> company. How do you do it? Like, how do you stay on top of it? Well, he doesn't, you know, he's got, <laughs> he's got people running all of these things. You know, if, if he's got time to sit on Twitter 10 hours a day and live stream playing fucking world of Warcraft or whatever he's doing on Twitch while making stupid memes. It just goes to, you know, people that are getting shit done. Don't have the time to do that. Somebody like, I don't know, Satya Nadella, right? He's running Microsoft. He's not fucking off all day, streaming on Twitch, playing Xbox, making fart jokes. You know, he's getting shit done and he's only got one company to deal with. So your level of, involvement in your business comes out in 
how much time and and actions that you have you know your actions that kind of show the public how much time you really do have on your hands and and this idea that people are just like wow you know and he is like he's like George Costanza in the Seinfeld like I just walk around annoyed all day looking annoyed and people think I'm working hard you know this idea that he's just like oh I'm exhausted and I'm sleeping on the factory floor and I've sold all my assets and it's I'm doing it all for the employees it's like it's just such a crock of shit and it's so obvious just like you know just like here's a question for you Mark how many news articles have come out, let's say, in the last two years that have had a negative impact on the company's stock that he has not immediately come out and just said false or lying? All, yeah. I think all of them, right? Well, we talked about – so um, that story last week from Reuters essentially said uh, two things. Thing number one is that the, the, the low-cost $25,000 car, let's call it the Model 2, has been canceled – but and they will instead turn their efforts into trying to develop robo taxis. Musk immediately rebuts it with Reuters is lying as usual. Well, okay, so what happened after that? The uh, he announced that they're going to show a, a robo taxi in four months. We'll, we'll talk about that. That's obviously just bullshit. Um, so what were they lying about? They are showing he did and then you say so. Are they lying that the Model Two was canceled? Is the model still happening? Why doesn't he say that? You know, uh, you know, and if it was canceled or even, you know, it, it's, certainly the company should announce something since I actually uh, spoke with some very, very big institutional investors who stupidly, in my opinion, were willing to give this company a chance as it gets closer to Model 2 launch time. Right. So this is this is this is material. This is the whole growth of the company in the mind of a lot of people. And was it canceled or not? Was it, or maybe, you know, maybe it was postponed till 2028 or 2029, which is also possible, right? But I, I mean, there's no 8K about this. This company, you know, there's no 8K about anything. Musk just calling Reuters, saying Reuters was lying as usual. He's a scumbag. I, I mean, he's just an obvious scumbag. So. Well, and the uh, article looked like it was sourced. Right. They made specific. It claims. was well sourced. And by the way, there's nothing as usual. Last the last article was um, uh, of, of major import was uh, that they lied on the um, on the range meters to fool people. So when people would get in the car, they think there was whatever, 400 miles of range. And then about halfway through the battery or whatever, it would suddenly drop to what the real range was, which was left, you know, which was a fraction of that. So he he said they were lying about that. Meanwhile, he, he never they had all kinds of proof that it wasn't a lie, all kinds of testimony from insiders. And the DOJ was adding that to its investigation. So, you know, he's a liar who calls people liars when he's been caught lying. That's the bottom line. That's actually I think you nailed it right there. And I just I wrote in this article last week or this week called the Musk of Desperation that I wrote that. That was excellent, by the way. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Yeah, I wrote that the 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 finesse, like there's no finesse. There used to be some finesse in like rebutting these things, but now it has just become like by rote. And so people see that, you know, the amount of time that it takes him to call somebody a liar when something negative about the company comes out. And he's done it to everybody, not just Reuters. He's done it to the SEC. He's done it to... You know, the victims of people that have died in the autopilot accidents. He, every single person that has said a bad thing about him, he has immediately come out. You know, he's like Trump. He just comes out <laughs> and says he, he's lying. He's wrong. He's highly overrated. You know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good impression. <laughs> but, but I mean, that's that's his thing. Right. He just he just says no and then just deflects and goes on. And, and it's sick because, look, on one hand, people are starting to understand it. And there were a lot more people on social media last week critical of how quickly he responded than I think normally would be. But on the other hand, what happened, right? The stock went back up above where it was. Well, well, well let's hang on. Wait. Let's hang on because this is interesting. Um, th so the stock, the stock was down, I'll, I'll make up a number, as much as $6 on that story, $7, something mm -hmm. like that, right? He comes out, he says, Reuters is lying. It only bounced back yeah, to roughly 
down three dollars or something right. and then it started drifting back down again the only way he got it higher was after hours when he because he saw that bullshit didn't work so then after hours he tweeted the new bullshit which is showing the robo taxi on on uh whatever august um august 8th 88 so and i'm happy to talk about why that will be total nonsense you know when when you're ready yeah and we definitely will i have a list of shit here but i just want to stay on this that you know after the fact too and he he did this also with the with the deliveries right the deliveries were a mess and so what was the response to that? It's okay. Well, we're not, we're not a car company. We're, Tesla is an AI slash robotics <laughs> an AI and robotics company. He says, so he pivots because if the valuation and the stock yeah, price is dependent it's the on, old, on yeah, the, it's, the old, it's the old stock scam stock promoter bullshit. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, what yeah. do you think his margin call level is at? I think it's uh, nowhere near what I thought it might be. And the reason I say that is uh, one of the very smart guys I follow on Twitter. I, f I forget his handle, but I, I don't follow that many people. He said 100, I, right? What's that? He said 100 even, that guy, right? No, no. I theorized it might be around 100. And he pointed out to me correctly that at least according to the last proxy, that they that they put in a, an internal limit of only of a three and a half billion dollar maximum amount of borrow that the CEO can do. Now that said, the last proxy was over a year ago, so they're they're due for one. I think it's by the end of April. I, I forget the the law on that, but pretty close anyway. Um, and you know, Musk would have no trouble disregarding any kind of internal rules such as that. But we can't really say. Uh, if, if that rule is in effect and obeyed, that the margin call is an issue because he's got um, um, like 100 and uh, no, I'm sorry, like 414 million shares of stock, I believe. So if he really only did borrow three and a half billion, you know, he's got plenty of room before he'd have a margin call, even at 25 percent uh, loan to value, which was another rule in there. He's allowed that. So that means he would only need. Uh, if, if he was actually obeying that, he would only need, what, $14 uh, billion dollars, uh, w worth of stock to support the maximum margin he could have. So that's a much lower price with if you've got 414 million shares. You right. know? Well, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be a margin call. It could be a re-rating. It's just, uh, I don't know. The, to me, it just, it never feels. But I mean, it's been like that for eight years. It's never felt natural. It's never felt. You know, just just that he can just come out and say, it wasn't me. Reuters is lying. It's not right. It's not true. You know, <laughs> and, and, and all of a sudden, oh, everything's fine. You know, oh, by the way, robo taxi coming. It's like, where's the fucking. And here's the thing with juggling these bullshit balls in the air one after the other. Right. And so the the death circle here has been and I wrote it in my article. So I'm going to read it to you real quick at the very bottom. The death circle for him has been this. The lower the stock goes, the more he has to lie to try to prop it up to prevent being margin called or just to prevent, you know, the house of cards from collapsing. The more lies he tells, right, the more consequences he sets up for himself and his team in trying to deliver on whatever the claims are that, that he lies about. And those claims have to get grandiose further and further as far, you know, further along he goes. It's like quantitative easing. It's like Musk quantitative easing. Then the more claims he can't deliver on, the more the regulators take notice and the more of a fool he makes of himself. And the more of a fool he makes of himself, the more targets he misses, the lower the stock goes and the less confidence the customers and shareholders have in him. And then the cycle has to repeat itself. So what we're seeing with like the cyber truck, right, was like, all right, here's the bulletproof windows. And then all of a sudden they throw a couple of metal balls at the windows and he makes a fool out of himself. And like, OK, well, that thing has like completely bombed. Now, right, the Cybertruck is pretty widely recognized as a pile of shit, as everybody knew it was going to be. So then he pivots from that to the robotics thing. And, you know, that launch was a disaster and a nightmare. And that thing's going to be a piece of shit, I'm sure. Then you still have the semis and the roadsters, which have been promised, which haven't happened yet. And you still have um, uh, you still have fucking full self-driving which is really the underbelly of everything and the robo taxis that still is not past, you know, level two autonomy. <clears throat> and so now he makes this claim robo taxis and you and I both know what's going to happen, 
right? Which is he's going to deliver either another timeline or a prototype or something that buys him another year or two until he fucks up again and has to make some other promise. But I mean, it really seems like he's in a circle of not being, not being able to deliver now, doesn't it? I mean, he delivered the Model 3. He got it out there. You know, he hasn't had a new model since then. He's made modifications to it. Doesn't it feel like he, it's really starting to slip out of his grasp here, or am I just imagining things? No, look, I mean, the reason I've been short this for so long, I just can't believe it's taken as long as it has. But by the way, I mean, we should keep in mind that the market's at all-time highs, and Tesla's all-time high was set over $400, uh, you know, in 2021. So yeah, that's a good point. Clearly, it's clearly in a, in a very long-term downtrend, and, you know, even though it's still a complete bubble and a fraud at, at the current market cap. Um, so, look, I mean, the thing on the thing on this robo taxi nonsense is, you know, maybe he'll show a car with no steering wheel and say, oh, yeah, and, and pretty soon it'll be a working robo taxi. We know for a fact his technology sucks for 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 for, um, you know, for autonomous driving. I mean, the latest version out, 12 point three, whatever, whatever, whatever. You know, I spent a lot of time going through fanboy, you know, comments on Twitter and stuff. And then there's plenty, of course, non-fanboy comments. I mean, what's his name? Dan, um, the Dawn Project guy, the software. Dan O'Dowd. Yo, Dowd. I mean, he's, he showed a video this morning, I think it was, of, of this thing hitting a mannequin in the middle of the road, simulating a kid, <laughs> right? So I just wax it three times. They tried it three different ways. But anyway, you know, all these people are like, oh, it's so improved. I only had one intervention in 30 miles. I only had one intervention in 40 miles, you know? I, 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 drove, I drove eight miles to work and had no interventions. Okay, let's take a step back. And I tweeted one simple thing about this, I think Monday morning. Let's take a step back. Let's be really fucking generous and say it only needs one intervention every 100 miles, okay? Which I have not even seen any fanboy been w able to claim and prove, okay? And let's just say that only half of those interventions would have resulted in an accident, okay? The other ones were whatever a minor intervention is. That's, that means if this were a robo-taxi, it would be crashing once every 200 miles, okay? That's one and a half crashes for every recharge of the fucking taxi, right? You charge it up to 300 miles, it, it, it crashed one and a half times on average in those 300 miles. I mean, it's absurd. I mean, if a, if a taxi goes, I don't know, probably 50,000 miles a year for a taxi, but just say 30,000 to make, to make, you know, if, if it's crashing every 200 miles, it, it, would, it would crash millions of dollars worth of crashes per year. I mean, this, I mean, the system is crap. For somebody to say, look, you know, people who are, who are ignoramuses say, oh, it's a great party trick. Look what it can do. And I only had a, I only had an intervene with it once every 30 miles and it did all this neat stuff. Okay, great. That's completely fucking useless for a business standpoint or a safety standpoint. If, you know, if, if the, I, I think that the numbers for like, um, well, okay, so the, the average person, and I looked this up and put this stuff on Twitter, the average person has a car accident once every 200,000 miles. That's the average, like a crash that does damage to the car once every 200,000 miles, okay? So until it can do that, it's not even as good as the average American driver, right? And now it's like, at, let's say, one every 200 miles, it would have a crash if there was nobody behind the wheel. It's absurd. It's so absurdly far from being anything useful. These, these morons are mesmerized by this little party trick. But so what? It's not a robo-taxi. And I don't even understand. I mean, these people are like, oh, it makes things so relaxing. If you have to sit there... I would be nervous worry, as fuck. Yeah, and, I would and, be... Yeah, and, and worry that in Musk's own words, it might do like the worst thing at the worst time or whatever the fuck he says. I mean, who needs that? It's like you're driving the car and your passenger might jerk the wheel at any time, right? right. <laughs> it's just jackassness. So, but you know what? That's what I'm saying. So who's buying this now? It's either, I mean, no institutional guy. I mean, there might be a couple of idiots out there. I hear them every once in a while on CNBC, but no real big money guy is going to fall for that crap. So it's, it's either massive, massive retail, which is possible, I guess, if, you know, because if it's every retail investor in the world 
maybe they can move a stock this big or you know it's somebody's offshore account you know propping it up with options well right? i mean so you know i saw a similar video this morning also from a bull which is interesting you know and it was same thing my my version 12.3.9 whatever the latest is he just said just blew right through a stop sign i don't know if you saw this video it was on twitter today Yes, and, I re Dan, uh, that guy O'Dowd posted it, I think, and I retweeted it, I think. But it yeah. was a bull that posted it. He, he must have retweeted it. It was a bull that posted it uh, initially. And the stop sign is right there, and it's clear as day in the divide in the road. And this thing, it, it never even slowed down. It's You know, the Tesla's, yeah. doing, Tesla's doing like 55 and just fucking keeps going right fucking yeah. right through it. I'm like, oh, my God, you know. I, and I, it, I, in terms of autonomy, <laughs> stop signs are pretty much like blocking and tackling, you know, I, like – <laughs> I mean, listen. I can't. I can't emphasize it enough. If 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 this robo taxi or this full self driving or whatever they fucking autopilot, if if it would crash without a human there, if it would crash more often than once every two hundred thousand miles, it's worse than the average human driver. Right. That's it. Bottom line. That's it. Right. And right now, it's about once every two hundred miles. Right. Which means it's a thousand times worse than the average human driver. And these jackasses are so impressed about, you know, the 55 times it didn't run the stop sign. Well, guess what? You know, if you're a human driver, you know, you drive, you drive 15,000 miles a year. And it's a very high probability that you never needed to intervene with yourself. Right? You drove. So... These people just have no, it's just such basic common sense. It's, you know, so anyway. Well, but so, then, then you got guys like, then you got guys like Ross Gerber, who when he's talking to Jim Chanos about Tesla putting robots in its factory, Chanos goes, well, Ross, there's been robots in auto factories since the 1980s. And, and Gerber's response is, yeah, but those are, those were dumb robots. These are smart robots. I mean, like so, that, that's, that's what you're dealing with you know, on the other you, side of the you, coin. But Gerber's a, listen, Gerber's a fucking moron and he doesn't have enough money to prop up a $500 billion. I'm stock. not talking about him propping it up. I'm just yeah. talking about the general. Well, no, what I'm saying is I'm not sure that there are enough morons out there with enough money to prop up a $500 billion. Are you serious? Stock. Don't you live in fucking Manhattan? They're everywhere. Oh, no, no. Manhattan, we're all smart here. Oh, oh yeah. Man. I was just in Manhattan. We, I'm sure we could trade examples. <laughs> I'm sure we could trade we do, some, some We do have a lot of crazy homeless people and gang members. I'll give you that. But, you know, I think your average gang member, if you, if you sat him down, would say, yeah, that Tesla, that's bullshit. Now, yeah. let, me go, <laughs> let, me go, let me go deal my drugs. Yeah. Uh, no way, know. man. I ain't getting in that car. <laughs> 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 that should have killed you, man. <laughs> I, I didn't sneak in here from Nicaragua to get that fucking thing. Fuck, um, fucking cars, crazy homes. I ain't getting in. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's possessed. <laughs> <laughs> but but anyway, so so look, so um, every legitimate robo taxi. And by the way, even once Tesla finally gets a robo taxi, if ever. There's, there's already a shitload of them on the road now, just like the robots. I mean, Jim Chanos tweeted yesterday about Hyundai. Hyundai has has <laughs> robo-taxis on the road now, and it owns Boston Robotics, right? Yeah. And it has a market cap, like a tiny fraction of Tesla. Yeah. But every single legitimate robo-taxi out there uses LiDAR, every single one, and radar. And, and Tesla has neither in its cars. I think it had radar for a while. Maybe it still has radar in the in the Model S and X, I'm not sure. But but they have no LIDAR. So and, and they've and they have no they you have to record apparently in California. You have to report how many autonomous testing miles you do every year. Right. I it's my understanding that their most recent reports, in fact all say zero. They've tested zero autonomous miles. So what the fuck is he going to show? Even if he shows something with no steering wheel and a LiDAR dome on top, it's completely untested. I mean, he's got no product. As I said on Twitter the other day, him showing that car and saying, this is, 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 is a robo-taxi and it's going to work great like a robo-taxi, you know, soon. That's exactly the equivalent of, um, of, of what's-her-name showing the Theranos blood machine, right? 
and which oh yeah this is our blood machine it's going to work great and it's the equivalent of trevor pushing the truck down the hill right right so right. you know unless musk says we've never tested it we, you know we've never tried it out it's going to take years that would be the honest thing he's not going to say the honest things he's a scumbag so you know the whole thing is absurd who knows what I'll, and look i joked about it on twitter but the way this thing happened right after that reuters story this was not fucking planned. There's no, no it wasn't. Way. No, it absolutely was not. And, 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 it absolutely was not. That, well, that, that's what I was talking about in my article. It's so fucking obvious, yeah. right? That, like, the stock starts to fall, a bad story comes out, and, and he's, like, in space balls. You know, when the guy's like, do something, and he turns around to another guy, and he's like, do something. And he gets on the fucking microphone, and he's like, do something. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just fucking, yeah, he, just so anybody do anything. It. And now they all have to scramble around and come up with some phony, fraudulent, uh, pseudo robo taxi in four months. <laughs> well, and he, and they're not. You think they would introduce lidar after all the shit that he said about lidar? Like how fucking well, stupid would he? So look? he's really he's really in a box there because <clears throat> to have a robo taxi, they need lidar. And, and yeah, if they put lidar on it, it exactly. inv it invalidates all the fucking hardware that they've already sold and promised exactly. everybody was what they he's needed so, for full oh, self driving. Exactly, he sold two hundred and fifty billion dollars worth of cars that he said had all the hardware they needed for full self-driving, you know? I mean, talk about a fucking lawsuit, right? I, you know, so, yeah, I, I, it's, the whole thing is nuts. Lawsuit? How does he get, how does he get away with it? It's 2024 well, the right way, now, so, okay? So I the, just did my uh, 2023 taxes. He started talking about full uh, self-driving in 2016. Well, there's two answers. Um, when he sold the cars, he would always say, you know, by the end of this year, hands-free driving on city streets, you know, but there was always a disclaimer like, this is our best guess, this is our best opinion, right? So unless you, I, I don't know if you can convict him of fraud unless you find a smoking gun uh, of, of email threads saying, yeah, I know this is bullshit, but I'm gonna say it anyway. But that said, they did find a smoking gun of that video in 2016 with the painted black, the stone song on the soundtrack. And at the beginning they go, um, the driver, you know, this driver isn't doing anything. He's only here for legal purposes. When in fact they had to splice together, you know, a whole bunch of separate pieces in order to make it look like one continuous run. And that's blatant fraud. That's pushing a truck down the hill. Listen, it comes back to what we said at the beginning of the conversation. How the hell is not, this guy not in jail for that or, you know, in court for that? Or maybe he will be from the DOJ the way that story said. I mean, it takes a while for them to put a case together. It's look, it's pretty clear that that Musk despises Trump, especially because Trump hates electric cars. Yet he's gone over to the Trump side. You know, he meets with Trump, blah, 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 because he's praying that uh, either the DOJ will drop the case because he'll be able to claim it looks political because he supports Trump, or he's praying that if Trump gets in, Trump will drop drop the case because Musk kiss, kicked his ass, you know, kissed his ass. I agree. Right? Yeah, I agree. One hundred percent. I wrote that a while back. This is this yeah, whole I mean, like pivot to the right has been a strategy move, you know, on his behalf because he's in deep shit, and I think it, you know if Biden. I mean, look, if Biden wins, we're going to have a lot of other problems to talk about. But if, <laughs> if Biden wins, I mean, I think that at some point in that next term, he's toast. Yeah, yeah. And look, he may be toast, you know, in the Trump term. I mean, look, you know, I pointed out I was, I was at dinner with some guys the other day and they talked about uh, what's his name? Bankman Freed. Bankman Freed, they told me, if I don't know if this is right, but it sounds right, was like the number one. Uh, campaign contributor to Democrats. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, he was. A, I don't know if he was number one, but he was a huge. Uh, okay. Campaign contributor. So Biden's a Democratic administration, and Bankman Fried is doing twenty five years in jail. So well, yeah, but so, that that was so obvious, and the you know that was like a full collapse right there. Everybody saw it. There was no getting around it. This there's a lot more gray area with this Tesla. Well, thing. so let's back. So let's back up a second to I mean, answer your question. So apparently, Tesla has. Every single person who buys uh, a car has to agree to arbitration. So, so somebody tried to do, I believe, a class action lawsuit about full self-driving being the fraud that it is, and it got thrown out of court because the judge said, no, everyone signed arbitration. You can't do a class action. So that means each person would have to sue them individually, 
which I think people have. I think some people in Europe, in Germany or something, I believe, sued and, and won an individual settlement. So it, it, then it bounces back to, well, who's going to do this? Well, I believe a state attorney general or a group of them could get together, you know, and sue the company because they're not they're not um, subject to any kind of arbitration agreement. They didn't buy the thing. And, and or the FTC could do it or something. But nobody does anything with this guy, seemingly, other than you hear these stories about behind the scenes stuff happening. So so go, just going back to what we were talking about before, didn't they also just find that he had a duplicate Twitter account that he like deleted on the day that yeah, they, yeah discovery? Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure he's got more than one. Look, what what um, happened in that uh, instant? He, he, had some, just tell the he listeners? had a Twitter account that was relevant uh, to the case. And the day, uh, I think the day the judge granted discovery, if I read it right, he deleted the account. <laughs> it's quite a coincidence. Uh, but he doesn't give a fuck. He doesn't care about any law. He just, he's, he thinks he's above the law and he's got lawyers, so we'll get him out of it. Or if he has to pay a small fine, whatever. But look, you know, at, at the end of the day, this guy will go down, okay? Everyone like this eventually goes down. They right. push things too far. Yep. Some ambitious attorney general, you know, decides to make him his project, you know, whatever. He'll, he, he will, you know, enough former employees whistleblow. He'll go down, you know, he'll go down and, and that'll be it. So, you know, and look, in the meantime, as I said on Twitter, you know, look, obviously I've been short this for a while and, you know, it, it was it was actually pretty profitable for us until last year when it had the huge run. But, you know, it's come off a good amount this year. And, you know, we've, we're down somewhat on it, not probably not huge on it. But to me, it's an opportunity when Reuters puts out that story and he says they're lying and the stock bounces. OK, I'll short more, you know, because I know they're fucking not lying, you know. Right. And uh, so, I mean, what do you think about the. Uh really uh, horrible i don't want to say horrible tepid reception to the cyber truck though far uh, so far well it's interesting actually so yeah uh clearly it was it was untested you see all the people that are like just bricking themselves and one guy i think had bricked it in like one mile or five miles after leaving the you know the tesla store to pick it up but you know they're bricking all over when they run it's gotten some interesting reviews. I think Motor Trend and one of the British car magazines said it didn't. It wasn't very truck-like. That it was pretty interesting to drive. They were impressed with the acceleration. But you know, it's a big, massive, ugly thing, and it's not really practical at all as a truck. So, who's the and and if you drive it, you look like a giant loser douchebag. So, who's the buyer for that thing? You know, I mean, you know, it, it's it, and it's a niche product, especially at that price. So. You know, maybe they may listen, maybe they can get it up to selling 50,000 a year to douchebags willing to spend that kind of dough. Even the, the one next year that's supposedly going to be cheaper, I who knows if we'll ever see that a cheaper one, right? So, you know, maybe they could sell 30,000 a year, 50,000 a year worldwide, some number, but it that that doesn't impact the company. You know, that's like that's an insignificant number relative to what what they need to move the needle at this point. I mean, you know, they did last year they did I think 96 billion of total revenue and i think 94 percent of that was was the auto business yep. right so it takes a lot to move the needle even that model two which would would have had probably almost no margin to it even that would not have moved the profit needle very much and it probably would have cannibalized you know the model three and the model y to some extent too so but the you, other you thing look is at this, you look at the secular <laughs> shift too in evs and kind of how everything is moving there's definitely been a correction here away from battery EVs and a little bit more towards hybrid. But then you just look at some of the competitors' products and, you know, what used to be a story of, you know, all these competitors are going to have products, which I remember you've been crowing about since 2016, it, oh, yes, yes, has, right. I, has yes. turned into there are some serious fucking competition on the market. You look at, like, what that Xiaomi put out that vehicle and you look at you know whatever whatever it's porsche benz hyundai volkswagen all the electric offerings and the one thing that for me in my mind if i was an auto if i was in the auto market that would stand out is the quality of the service you know like if i have an issue with a volkswagen i know that i'm going to take it somewhere where they know exactly what they're doing with it and you know i just keep seeing all these horror stories about tesla service 
And, uh, you know, what do well, you Well, not only exactly what they're doing, but A, you can get an appointment, and B, they have the parts. Right. right. So, I mean, look, the bottom line is Musk runs this company cutting corners and skimping wherever he possibly can in order to show, you know, some level of profits, especially when it was vesting his stock. That's the funniest, man. I have to say, that is fucking karma. He, you know, he cut corners, didn't develop new models. God knows what kind of financial shenanigans he pulled in order to meet those five stages of getting his stock awards. And then they fucking get taken away from him. <laughs> and then, and now if the whistleblowers come forward and nail him for various frauds, that would be like, that would be the, what, the coup de grace. He, he lost all the stock awards and, and whatever bullshit he pulled in order to get them, he, he, he would go to jail for or, or get booted out of running a public company or whatever. <laughs> well, you know, should have never happened to begin with. Well, but, but anyway, so the point you were just making, which is a point I started to make earlier in the conversation and got sidetracked. The reason I shorted this thing is I know the auto industry. Nothing stays new or novel in the auto industry for more than Ten one months. model cycle, right? Right. A model cycle is, you know, three to five years, and then everybody's going to have it. I think we may have talked about this a long time I'm ago. I'm sure we have. You know, power steering, automatic transmission, FM radio, air conditioning, power windows, right? S somebody had that first, every one of those things, right? And within four years or whatever, everybody had it, right? And so it's the same thing. And the thing you hear about the Tesla, which was the funniest part was, oh, it's no one can do what they do. And the beauty of it is how simple it is. Well, <laughs> pick, pick one. <laughs> you know? Well, and they haven't, they haven't, they don't have a new model refresh coming out. You know, they, we're looking at, we're staring at the same models now for a couple of years. Well, they have what they and, call a refresh, but for, for instance, on a model three, there were some improvements like a nicer interior. But then they got rid of the fucking turn signal stocks, which is a huge negative. And by the way, Europe uh, passed a law recently that you're going to have to have knobs in cars for a lot of key functions. No more of this touchscreen only bullshit, which to me, I think it makes, I think it makes perfect sense. I think it makes Tesla's really dangerous. I think, by the, you know, you, I'm sure you know, we've seen it. The stats say that they crash more often than like any other car. And... You know, part of that for sure is probably, you know, people not used to the instant torque. But another part of it is you have to look down at the goddamn screen to right. do anything. Right. I'm, you know, so. No, that's, and that's why those buttons in your <laughs> legacy vehicles are the way that they are and why they're configured and why they have patterns on them and why they're different shapes so that you I, can reach up and you can adjust the radio without having to take your eyes off the road. Or I, you can adjust I am so, yeah, I am so happy. I bought a new car last year. I'm so happy. It has all kinds of knobs on it besides the stuff on the steering wheel. Right. I think, I think the new Corvette is really cool. It's got that whole line of switches that, you know, that goes down along the center divider. You know what I'm talking I don't know if yeah, you look. It, it's a nice looking car too on the outside. But, well, the outside, but the inside, I think that's cool. Switches are practical and cool and touch screens are just nonsense. You know, that has hurt Volkswagen, by the way. We should talk about that for two minutes because it's my biggest long position. Hang on, we but, will. Let me, I'm trying to look at the, yeah. uh, this is the 2024 Corvette you're talking about, right? Oh, all right. Yeah, I see like the bar uh, on the passenger side going down the uh, center console. Is that well, what you're talking about? The driver's side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See all the buttons for the driver? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's on. The, it's actually on the passenger side of oh, the car okay. in the in the center console. Okay, but the buttons like face the driver, I think. Yeah, it's right like now. a wall of buttons that goes down. Yeah, right? yeah that is that's, pretty cool. Now, see that that cool. that digital screen there and that digital display makes sense. Like a lot of other like the like the Benz EV and stuff like that. But you can still see there's plenty of stuff there on the steering wheel that you can use with your thumbs, with like, you know, the idea of having to go down and fucking use an iPad every time you want to, you know, turn the <laughs> turn the air conditioner down one degree, it's it's extremely dangerous. I never understood that. I, I when any, Even when I would get into Teslas that my friends had, you know, watch them try to operate it. It's cool at first. It's a novelty because in essence, you're, you know, with, you're, you're taking your, your phone theoretically and just putting it into your car. And so there's a novelty in that, but the, in terms of practicality, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Well, to have uh, to press a digital screen every time listen, you want something. Car companies did it because it's much, much cheaper. 
than wiring up a bunch of knobs. Right. So, so you know, and but Musk tried to state it, stage it as, oh yeah, it's really cool. You know, it's this novelty item. It's like a spaceship. Well, when you're running a spaceship. You don't have to keep your eyes on the road looking for stops. Well, you ever see the cockpit of a fucking airplane or a spaceship? There's there's a trillion knobs and buttons. Yeah, well, that too. Knobs too. Yeah, not just touch screens. But anyway, so, but it's really, it was a cost-saving thing for all these car companies. But, you know, now they're going back to, to knobs. I mean, part of it is because legally they have to. But I will never buy a, a touch screen only uh, car, nor will I buy a car, you know, you know, like BMW kind of does with a touch screen, but, you know, the center knob to pick your menus. So, right. you don't. Yeah, I'm not going to do that either because you still have to take your eyes off the road, you know. So yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. But I, but I think BMW, I, I know Porsche for sure does, has, um, um, you know, stuff on the steering wheel that control stuff. And then key stuff, most of these guys have like a volume button for the radio, let's say, you know, and whatever. But. You know, and Volkswagen had some problems with with that. They came out with touchscreen only, and they sucked. So they just improved the touchscreens on the newest models. They're faster, but they're still touchscreens. I have no doubt that their next generation of cars will go back to key knobs for for a lot of functions. You know. So what were you gonna say about Volkswagen? You said it was your biggest lawn. But yeah, I just want to say this that that um, you can look at it two ways. One way is it's selling for around four times earnings as a, as a corporation. Um, and the other way to look at, and you know, pl plenty of net cash excluding the finance arm. So it's not like loaded, loaded with, you know, functional debt, let's call it. Um, and the, but the other way to look at it is it owns 75% of Porsche, which trades separately publicly. And it owns, uh, 89% of, um, Trayton, which is the truck division. And if you net those two out, it has a negative market cap. Of in, in the billions of euros and you get Audi, you know, Ducati, Bentley, Volkswagen cars itself, uh, Skoda, you know, um, a couple other, you know, a couple other smaller brands, Lamborghini, which alone is probably worth 15 billion, you know, euros or dollars. I mean, it's crazy. It's, it's so crazy that, you know, it's, it's like a, a hugely negative market cap and dirt cheap and it pays a huge dividend. It pays like a roughly an 8% yield, you know? So I own it. it. In fact, right now in the fund, because I'm so bearish, it's it's our only long position. I own a ton of it. You know, people say to me, well, if it's so obvious, you know, blah, 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 blah. And to me, it's like that old joke about, you know, the two economists are walking along and, and there's a $20 bill in the road. And one guy says, hey, there's a $20 bill. And the other guy says, eh, it must be fake. Otherwise, somebody would have picked it up already. Right. You know? <laughs> to, 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 me, that's, to me, that's Volkswagen. It's just hiding in plain sight. People are like, well, you know, you got to deal with the unions because they're on the board. And, the, and then the local government has seats on the board. OK, fine, whatever. At the end of the day, it generates a lot of cash and it's paying 8%. You know? And they're not, it's not as if they're, you know, it's not as if they're borrowing money to pay the dividend. So... One way or another, you're going to get paid to own this thing, you know? Yeah. So anyway, so that's my long. Enough of that. I, I, I don't have to keep going on. People can look at it themselves. Oh, I will say this, that I own it through the ADR, the ticker's uh, VWAPY. Uh, there's another ADR, which is VWAGY. The, the one I own is called preferred shares, but it, all that means is it's actually common shares that don't have a vote. And so you, you get a big discount for not having a vote. Your vote would be useless because the Porsche family controls the the vote anyway. So, you know, you don't need a vote. So if you're going to get the ADR, I, I recommend VW Alpha Papa Yankee, not Alpha Golf Yankee. All right. Well, I want to go back to Tesla real quick, too. Did yeah. you see that they settled the <clears throat> lawsuit? Uh, the the one that they said that they would never settle with the engineer oh, the who died day. in the autopilot accident one day well, before it went to well, trial? Yeah, they, they weren't referring specifically to that when they said never settle. Musk said on Twitter, um, and I'm paraphrasing, um, uh, we will never settle a suit where we where we know we're right and, uh, you know, we will always pay when we know we're wrong or something. I'm, it's paraphrased. So, yeah, they settled this lawsuit, uh, that was the Apple engineer in California who crashed on the highway and died uh, on autopilot. And, you know, supposedly he was looking down at a video game 
while he was driving. But as I said on Twitter, you know, this was the time when Musk put out the video saying you don't need a driver here. You know, he's only there for legal reasons. Musk went on 60 minutes, hands free. No. Hey, look, look, whatever that Leslie woman. Stahl. Yeah, I remember that. Look, Leslie, no hands. She goes, is the car driving itself? Yep, it's driving itself. You know, he did all this stuff and then he tried to have these little fine print disclaimers, right? That say, oh, well, you need to pay attention at all times. Well, this guy was a Musk cult boy and he believed his his cult leader, Elon. And guess what? He died because his cult leader, Elon, is a lying scumbag. So, you know. All right. Well, now let's go to macro. This The way that today looked to me was kind of, you know, we got CPI data that came in hot this week. The way that the market looked to me today, the, the trade that I saw at the end of the day today was kind of the throw your hands up, fuck it, we're letting inflation win trade uh, where gold and silver are rocketing, uh, equities are rocketing. And uh, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think I'm right or do you think we're going to hit well, a wall let, at some point and we'll crash and then? All right, let's 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 unpack that a little bit. I, I agree that, that a lot of people now think, well, the Fed's going to throw up his hands and its hands and accept whatever, you know, 2.8 percent core PCE. Right. And, and core CPI is running 3.8 percent. Right. Throw up his hands and, you know, certainly not raise rates and maybe cut rates a little bit. And we're just going to have permanently higher inflation and therefore gold is flying. That's totally plausible. Um, the 10 year yield is flying. Uh, which would also jibe with that theory. Here's where it, here's where stocks flying doesn't fit in. And, and I'll tell you two things. One thing has been in front of my letter the last couple of months. Um, Standard & Poor's itself has an amazing free spreadsheet. There's a link to it. If you reach out to me, I'll send you the, the link. They update it every week to 10 days, showing every dissecting S&P 500 earnings in every possible way. But their key is, S&P 500 operating earnings were actually lower last quarter, Q4 of 23, than they were in Q4 of 21. In other words, if, if you look at the last really two and a half years of S&P 500 operating earnings, and I'm not even holding them to gap, they've bounced around a little bit, but they've essentially made no progress. They've been up one quarter, down one quarter, up one quarter. And this was with uh, what, like, over 3% GDP growth, right, for a lot of that time. So corp if corporate earnings aren't growing with great GDP growth, number one, what happens if the economy does hit a wall? They'll probably plunge. And by the way, why aren't they growing? Maybe they're not growing because costs are growing faster than earnings, right? So that, that's, that's one thing. The other thing is, if we are going to have a new permanent higher inflation regime, we need huge stock multiple compression, you know, PE multiple compression. So if you look at like what happened in the 1970s when we had the huge stagflation, right? Stocks plunged in call it the first half of the decade, approximately, not exactly, but you know, because PE multiple, because even though there was inflation and back then they would post higher nominal earnings a lot of times, the PE multiples compressed from whatever they were, teens to like eight or something like that because you're not going to pay as much of a multiple for earnings if, you know, if, or if rates are high and you can get a lot in a money market or, or, or a treasury bond yield or whatever. So once you sort of bottom out on where PEs are, okay, then if inflation is making earnings go up, then stock prices can go up in nominal terms, right? right. But, but PEs have to crash first. So, yeah, they do. So I do not think, because stocks are expensive now, right? The S&P... Um, um, P.E. ratio is in the 20s, right? I, I don't uh, think... The high 20s, I think, right? What's that? I think I, I think it's in the high 20s, isn't it? It's north of 25. Uh, if you hang on, if you hang on one second, I can give you a number. Can you hang on? A, let me let me pull it yeah, up I here. I got no life. <laughs> Hold on a second. Nor do I. That's why I'm talking to you. There you Hold go. <laughs> hang on. So, uh... I'm pulling up that spreadsheet right now, actually, the, the, whatever the latest version of it is. So Q4, uh, Q4 uh, S&P 500 operating earnings uh, were 5390 
And by the way, okay. the only reason they were, and, and that was, by the way, lower than Q2 of 2023 and lower than uh, Q4 of 2021, just to make my point here. All but right. the, so, the, but and, the, and the only reason they were as high as 5390 is Buffett marks his portfolio. That's 216, obviously. that's 216 annualized. So you're talking 25 times earnings about. You're, you're way ahead of me, right, exactly. So here, so yeah, 53.90 times four is 215.60. And where did the S&P close today? Wow. 51.99. 51.99 divided by 215.60. 24 times, call it run rate operating earnings, right? Right. The historic market multiple is something like 16. 16. Yeah. <laughs> so, yep. you know, I mean, this so, so – if we're and then gonna that's the more... average. That's the mean. It's been below the that, mean. you know? Correct, yeah. So if we're going to have more inflation, you know, we're going to get some big multiple compression. So, you know, oh, so so look, so if, if you're technically inclined at all, <clears throat> uh, you guys, uh, you, you folks playing playing along at home, if you pull up a one-year uh, daily candlestick <laughs> chart. <laughs> Fucking cut, cut to the shot of my listeners, like, crushing a beer can on their forehead. <laughs> Uh, Mark, you're like, uh, take your calculators out if you guys are at the desks, you know. I had a guy fucking email me the other day. He's like, I always listen to you when I'm mowing the lawn. I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So watch your foot, buddy. Um, so anyway, if you if you look at a one-year uh, daily candlestick uh, chart of, of SPY, let's say, right, th there had been really strong closing support at like the the 10 day and then the 20 day moving average for almost this entire run up with a couple of very minor short lived exceptions. Last week on April 4th, there was a giant red candlestick that just crashed through everything, right? And I think what we've seen since then are is, is the market trying to sort of grab back up that that momentum that it had and i think it's gonna fail it looks to me like a bunch of days kind of with fingernails trying to grab at that cliff of the even today it it climbed you know because uh, previous support then becomes resistance right. it climbed back of uh, towards in the afternoon it climbed back up above the 10 day and 20 day but it couldn't hold them and it closed below them somewhat so I think this. I think it's dip buyers trying to get it back, but I think that candlestick meant an entire change of regime for the market. Now that said, I am very short spy. I will stop out probably half of my short position if the opening price on that candlestick gets taken out, and that was in the 523s. It was. Uh, um, yeah, hang on, let me give you the exact number in case for you for you home players. Uh, 523.52. I think would would scare me that oh maybe the maybe the uptrend is resuming again for whatever reason that I do not understand. Well, I think liquidity is just going to run out at some point too. I mean, I just I saw today again as I've been seeing for the last three years that Philadelphia Fed data showed that credit card debt was at all time highs again. So, you know, just another day forward at five and a half percent rates. It's okay. You know, yeah, at, yeah. Well, that's at, at some point, the check comes due, man. I'm, I just saw another thing today. Some commercial real estate sold for like two cents on the dollar in like in like San Francisco. There's some building that sold for like six hundred million the last time it changed hands in 2006 sold for like 10 million or something ridiculous. And I'm just like, yeah. OK, like where are those losses going? Well, um, look, well, p probably pension funds. Yeah, right? a lot of it. But I mean, look, you and I have both been talking about this for a long time, which is I, I do not believe you can have a, an, an, an economy, an asset base uh, built on 15 years of free money. And all of a sudden, you know, nominally money costs over 5 percent. Right. Without things breaking and imploding. And yeah, so commercial real estate lenders have been doing the old extend and pretend but at some point you got to stop pretending and extending. Right. So, <laughs> you know, but that's only part of it. Yeah. It's, it's the consumer with the credit cards. It's, it's, you know, who the hell can buy a pickup truck with a $1,300 a month payment now? I mean, some people are, but you know, a lot of those are probably going to be coming back too. So yeah, I mean, this yeah, thing is two, two terrible uh, treasury auctions this week too. I saw. 
Well, today's was a little worse than expected. The one yesterday was horrible. In fact, was it yesterday the ten year one? Whatever. It was yeah, horrible. yesterday was the ten year with like yeah. a three three basis point tail or something. And I didn't see today's, but I saw that it you know it tailed, but I didn't see by how much. Yeah, the thirty. Well, I saw the yield on the thirty was a little a tiny bit worse, maybe one basis point or something than the one issued, but it wasn't better. But you know what? That's when the market really took off. Like it was like, oh, you know, it wasn't as bad as we thought it would be. So is there an excuse to buy stocks? I mean, I think these are just whatever dip buyers who are going to get burned. I mean, talk about liquidity. So, you know, they've been saying financial conditions are loose, but that's a very circular argument. They're loose because stock prices have been high, right? Once that reverses, financial conditions aren't loose anymore. I mean, you know, money is is not cheap. It's it's you know moderately. You know, it's it's it costs money to to borrow money now for real. You know. And, and the Fed still is running off its balance sheet. And, you know, this whole thing about the, uh, what was it, the, R, the RRP or whatever that they were drawing down, and, that, you know, that was going into stocks. I mean, you know, that was because people decided they want to buy stocks. They didn't have to, that money did not have to go into stocks and bonds. It went into it because investors got the, the animal spirits and decided to draw down the RRP and put it into stuff. So, you know, that, that's a that's not a leading indicator. That was a little bit of a trailing indicator, like, oh, I'm going to buy stocks and now I'll draw down the RRP to settle my stock buy within a day or two, you know. But that said, if it's drawn down, even if they want to buy stocks, where are they going to get the money from, you know? So, yeah, I'm, I'm bearish. I could be wrong, but I think this market is, is hanging on. And I think that giant red candle last week was a major trend change marker. I am drinking a Pabst. Okay. Um, oh, I have to tell you a funny story real quick before okay. we go. Speaking of your Pabst. Wait, 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 wait. But I, I yeah. wanted to comment on something, but now I can't remember what the hell I was going to say. Uh, what were we talking about? The price, we were talking the cost of capital. Oh, I just wanted to add that, you know, maturities are, are rolling along. People, you know, these refinances that are going to happen, like it was probably a little bit easier to refinance the first like year, first year and a half that they started raising rates. And, and now all of a sudden with, you know, with the line stuck at five and a half percent, every fucking refinance that comes to, and I forget who it was that I just saw. It's a pile of shit company. I think it was Herbalife just refinanced some fucking garbage, senior secured, whatever, like 13 and a half percent or something. I'm just like, all right, like they're, <laughs> they're done, you know, like, and, and that's how it's going to be for everybody. No, I'm no. actually surprised at that because last I looked spreads were ridiculously tight for garbage, you know, I mean, tight to treasury. So I don't know, maybe, maybe things have changed or maybe that was a fluky situation. I, I didn't, I didn't follow that, but. Well, other than the entire business model is centered around a mathematical impossibility. I'm not sure how much more. Of a oh, fluke. You mean, oh, you mean the, uh, the, 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 the pyramid scheme or whatever. Yeah. Or whatever. Exactly. The old, uh, I'm going to give you a piece of shit product that nobody would be, would be interested in if I didn't staple it to a business opportunity model, <laughs> you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, so about your beer. So it's funny. So, you know, I go out to dinner with with friends, various people, a lot of times Wall Street types, you know, once, twice a week or whatever. And, you know, I, I used to drink right along with those guys. And now I'm just like Diet Coke. And and they're like, you know, what are you on the wagon? Or you got a problem? I'm like, no, I, I try to limit myself, you know, unless I'm on vacation to like three drinks a week only because I know it's not really good for your body. The more you read about alcohol, it's terrible for you. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, you start packing on pounds. It's just empty calories. So I'm like, and, and you know, I, I could with booze, I've always been take it or leave it. I don't care, but you know, I like beer. So three, so what happens is my girlfriend every Christmas gets me uh, memberships in the craft beer of the month club. And she got me two different clubs this year. So the, these great craft beers, come in every month a shipment of them sometimes there's like a dozen of them and they're just piling up in boxes so i have to do my drinking at home if i'm going to limit myself well to you should have told drinks. me that the other day when i said i was in manhattan and i'm, yes. I'm going to come over for a coffee you should have said my fridge is stock full of craft beer that i can't get I, rid of i was i would have shown it to you i mean in fact you you um i didn't know what happened there yeah i mean for for people out there who don't know i i got a text from um from Chris in the morning, like, hey, I'm in town. You, you want to get together? I said, I don't really want to leave the, the screens, but come on over. And then I never heard from you. So Yeah, well, but I had a friend uh, a friend from out of town that I would have normally never been able to see 
came into town, and so that um, sadly took precedence. But I'll be back, and we will get that coffee or beer for sure. Well, yeah, you come over. I will show you. And, and, and I really want to show it to you because I know you know your beer. I don't know why you're drinking Pabst. Is it because you're you're short today and the market went up, or what? <laughs> uh, I don't know. No, it's because I live by a deli that sells it. And, okay. you know, it's reasonably priced. And uh, Yeah. As I said, the market uh, yeah, it's went It's like up. a comfort it's beer. Perfect. I've been drinking Pabst since I was much younger. But look, I- I'm with you, man. I'm, I-, I have actually gone through some of the longest bouts of sobriety um, that I've ever gone through over the last, like, probably six months. And, uh, and it's been wonderful. To-, to be frank with you, it's just been, uh, it's just been great. You well, you, pro- you probably in the past... I mean, I think you were a bartender at one point, right? Mm-hmm. Part-time. I mean, you probably drank a lot more than a I ever did. A ton. Yeah. I mean, I mean, alcohol has never been an important part of my life. It's like, yeah, I enjoy a beer, but I don't want to have too many because I don't want to get fat, you know? So, um, yeah, so it's a little, it's been, it hasn't been a handicap. I like Diet Coke as much as I like beer. I like so. Diet Coke too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you so. start to realize with, with the alcohol, there's a couple of things that I realized just over the last few years, the the first is that, you know, once you once the once the fever breaks, and by that I mean, when you're drinking, if you ever read like Alan Carr, easy way to stop drinking, he talks about this. Uh. Excuse me, um, but <laughs> <laughs> once you're drink, once you're drinking, you have a couple of beers, you wake up the next day, and you go through work, and you know whatever. It's a classy show, huh? You get oh, who cares, you know. <laughs> you think anybody's made it an hour and eleven minutes into this interview? <laughs> This is fucking me and you just fluffing each other at this point. <laughs> but uh, what you learn is that um, once the fever breaks, meaning, you know, the next day you kind of have this anxiety like, oh, I should have a beer again. And and part, part, if not most of what that is, is leftover anxiety from your previous hangover. And this is even only if you have two, three beers. I'm not I'm not going out and binge drinking or taking 20 beers to the face, you know, but like. If you can stop for two weeks, usually around 10 to 14 days is where I feel it. If I take 10 to 14 days without drinking any alcohol at all, I feel like I'm in a completely different calm space mentally. Uh, and that's something that I learned over the last you know few years that I really embrace about, I mean, aside from the fact that it's terrible for you, right? And aside from the fact that you're borrowing happiness from today, from tomorrow to, to take it today, which is essentially what happens. You're, you're relieving anxiety now, but you're going to, it'll be visited upon you twice as much well, tomorrow. You know, to that, that once, I, I, sorry, the point is that, that just once yeah. you take a break, like I took like uh, about 40 days here. I went on a trip two weeks ago and, and the 40 days before that I took off. And uh, and it felt fantastic. Like it just felt, you know, my, start eating more. Unfortunately, but <laughs> what were you gonna say? No, I was just say I've never. I, I'm just one of those people. I've just never had a a drink to relieve anxiety, or even, you know, uh, well, I guess when I was when I was in college, you drink and, to get drunk or whatever. But you know, even to get a buzz on, I just really like the flavor <clears throat> of an interesting beer, or for that matter. Uh, you know, an interesting whiskey, you know, like, you know, I, I, we have a couple of great, um, you know, one's a blended, one's a single malt. These Japanese whiskeys oh, yeah. are really great. <clears throat> and it's funny, you know, when I have that, maybe, th- you know, they sit around forever. Because maybe three, four times a year I'll have one drink. It's when I'm watching, inevitably, a gangster movie and the gangsters sit around and they <laughs> and and they pour the and they pour like the whiskey, right? Ex- except when it was like Narcos, and then they were pouring like the tequila. I don't have any tequila here. Even like but, detectives in the 1920s used to keep whiskey in their desk. Exactly, they keep it in the desk. Not the tw- the 40s, the 50s, all those film noirs. They always had a bottle of whiskey in the desk. They, so did the cops, for that matter, and they pull it out, you know. So yeah, if it's a scene like that, because I watch a lot of movies, as you probably know, it's a scene like that. I'm like. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna join them. I'm gonna get into this mood, and so I'll have like a little glass of the the whiskey. But yeah, I again I I like the flavor. I don't I don't drink to get whatever. What's I, I, What's the best craft beer that you had out of this new selection that you got? I you know I can't I, I there's so many I would go over there, but the microphone is is tied here. <laughs> um, You're like Trump with the Bible verses. He's like, well, uh, I guess they're all kind of my favorite. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not. It's, no, it is. It isn't like that. Uh, <laughs> I, ne- I, I kind of just like them all. 
No, I never remember the names. Like here, if I, like here, here's this under my desk here is, uh, here. Okay, so this one's in cans. There's the Honeyed One High Hops Brewery in, uh, where the hell is this? It's, um, hang on a second. It's in Windsor, Colorado. Okay. okay. This is Fayette Brewing Company, Embers, Chocolate Hazelnut Porter. Ugh. These guys are in Boise, Idaho. Here's a Sofa King Dreamy Tropical IPA. This is from, uh, same thing, Fayette Brewing in Boise, Idaho. Here's a... Uh, um, hang on a second. Now the first two sound terrible because I don't like honey in my IPAs and I don't like deep chocolate porters, but the tropical IPAs can sometimes have some nice, like, flowery kind of, uh, like the Ithaca Flower Power is, like, one of my favorite IPAs. It's a great fucking beer. That's my girlfriend's favorite IPA. Okay, so wait a second. So I literally have... Okay, so now here's another box. Okay. Oh, this is uh, German. Hof, Hofbrau House... Freezing Dunkel Dark Lager. No, this okay. Is, is this from Germany? Um, it's probably from Germany. Um, okay, so all right, so that's one, and then and then also in this case or this box, Quad Dark Unfiltered tr Quadruple from Saint Foyen uh, Brewery, maybe in Belgium. What, what's or something? that like? Fucking ten and a half percent? I'm gonna guess. Or something? Eleven. Eleven. Yeah. Eleven. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so there's that one. There's uh, there's a bunch of bottles of that. Actually, it's those two in here, and I have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, five bottles of each of those. Okay, hang on, I got one more. Hold on. I like Germans, but I just like I like nice, cool, crisp pilsners in this in the hot summer. That's about it oh, for yeah. me, German. I oh, can't awesome. I can't drink Oktoberfest beers. I don't like super malt forward beers. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here's the next box. Alamo Amber Lager. A Vienna-style lager with notes of caramel for a little something extra. This this place is in uh, where are these guys are I don't want something uh, extra. I want something less. Maybe San that's Antonio, why I'm drinking Paps. Al <laughs> Alamo beers in San Antonio. Uh, Luna Coffee Stout. Ugh. That's uh, where are these guys from? These guys are... I don't know. I can't. It's somewhere on here. Um, hang on a second. All right. Um, oh wait. Yeah. Out. Did I Alamo Golden Ale? So I got a. I got an amber from them and a and a golden ale. Any of those and stouts? Then, any of those stouts? Are they in sixteen ounce like with widgets in the cans, or are they all just regular cans? I sometimes get those, but these are just all like uh, uh, twelve ounce bottles. Okay. And then and then an IPA from H Hinterland is the brewery IPA. These guys are located. And uh, I, I can't read the label. Some I don't know where they're located. But anyway. So if any so, of my listeners know any of those, they should <laughs> they should hit you up on Twitter and let you know which to drink and which to avoid, right? <laughs> my, my, I'm a skeptic, so I always think like, well, if it's included in some like mystery beer club, it's probably shit. You know. That's... No. I, you know what? I, I've had so many different ones. I can't even remember. You know. The only the only ones I remember are the ones I. I, I always get in restaurants, you know, like I, you know, like it, I really like a, like an Allagash wheat beer or whatever, but that's almost yeah. mass market at this point. These are much more Still obscure a good beer. That's my, that's my flying home beer. Anytime. I, I don't know why I have these routines with certain drinks and beers. Like I always drink ginger ale on the plane. I always drink champagne at certain times, but Allagash white is when I come home from a trip, I always go and I unpack and I get my shit home. No matter what trip I'm in, if I'm gone for more than a couple of days, I always go to the same bar and I always get an Allagash White. It's like my welcome home present. I don't know why, just comfort, I guess. But well, that I first had that I think up in in Maine. I think it's from Portland, Maine, right, or somewhere in Maine. And um, there's a great chain up called Luke's Lobster. Uh, Luke's Lobster Roll. You know, do you have them in Philly? No, they're, they're, I don't think so. Well, any, we have Tony Luke's. What's that? We have Tony Luke's. Oh, to that, what is that? Eh, a Sounds bunch like of Italian guys serving cheesesteak. Just got nabbed for tax evasion this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cash only. Go down there, try ordering a lobster roll at one of those places, see what they do. <laughs> The fuck anyway. out of here, you pompous motherfucker. <laughs> speaking, speaking of which, this is why I love New York. I, I, I got a haircut when I was there like last week, and I'm sitting at, uh, I'm sitting at this barbershop, and this guy, and it's in Midtown. This <clears throat> this kid walks in, 
And uh, the guy goes, you know, hey, hey, how you doing? I'll be with you in a second. And the kid goes, yeah, yeah, good. Uh, uh, listen, uh, I need to, uh, I need to do some fucking thing with this shit. And points to his, <laughs> points to his face and his hair. And that's how he ordered his haircut. And the guy's like, okay, uh, I got something for you. Sit down. You know, I was thinking, man, I went in there. I was like, hey, I want like a number one, and you know, don't shape up the sides and whatever. The guy from New York walks in. He's like, yeah, I need to do something with this fucking shit on my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. You know, I'm watching. I talked about it on Twitter, but there was a, it was a series from 2022 uh, um, called The Offer, and it's it's I think it's ten parts. It's behind the scenes in the making of The Godfather. Oh wow! It's on um, it's on um, uh, Paramount okay. Channel. Um, but it's what it's really about. It's it's half about that. And, and what you reminded me of it there is they had to deal with mobsters in order to get the movie made in New York. It's pretty entertaining. But it's also about Hollywood itself in, like, the late 60s, early 70s. And it centers around Robert Evans, who was the most entertaining guy ever. Did you ever read or hear or see the movie The Kid Stays in the Picture? No. Oh, my God. You got to... Write down the kid stays in the picture. I put Either it right that, here next to Apocalypse Now, which somebody told me last week I need to watch also. You've never seen Apocalypse Now? No. Is that oh bad? My. Yeah, see, oh I got the same God. response <laughs> from them. They're like, dude. Make sure, you see, make sure you see the director's cut, which is probably the only one out there now, which okay. is the long version. Apocalypse Now is a friggin' masterpiece. It's like, it's like a war movie from another planet. I mean, there are plenty of great war movies. This isn't even a war movie. I don't know what the hell it is. It's just... It's just, it's stunning. But anyway, so back back to the, um, um, uh, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah, back to the, 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 um, the offer. So it's entertaining as hell. But Robert Evans, who produced, uh, well, he ran Paramount when they made The Godfather, Love Story, um, Chinatown, like a lot of massive hit movies. He was such a character. Just write down the documentary, The Kid Stays in the Picture, because he narrated it when they, it, it came from his book. It's, you'll see how entertaining this guy is, and then you see, and then you watch the offer, and you see him in the offer along with the other characters. It's entertaining as hell. I can't wait to get back to it. I was going to watch it, you know, before we set this thing up. So yeah. Okay, will do. So I got some. Good I also recommend. I also recommend. Highly recommend. Um, um, the Japanese show that's on Hulu that everyone's watching. That's so great. Which Which one is that? Um, geez, why am I drawing a blank? Um, it's, it's about the, um, the warlords in like, you know, whatever, hundreds uh, of years ago. I don't, um, I don't have Hulu. People will know what I'm talking about. I'm drawing a blank. Anyway, it's also really entertaining. You don't have Hulu? What do you have? Uh, I got Netflix and, uh, Rabbit Peacock. Ears? That's <laughs> it. You know, oh, well, you, got- you know, it's fucking ridiculous. It's insane. And it's getting even worse with the sports. You know, I just want to watch an NFL game. I got to have Amazon prime now. Like, fuck you. You oh, know, so you don't have, you don't have Amazon Prime to get deliveries anyway? No, I don't, because I don't fucking order shit from Amazon. Like all these sociopaths in my building, I can't even get through the goddamn lobby every day, <laughs> and I I feel like I want to just start giving the fucking UPS driver hundreds because I can't believe how much shit he's got to haul inside the building every day. It, it's it's absolutely insane. There's it's like Fantasia. There's fucking just boxes on top of boxes on top of boxes, and it just never stops. And people are just ordering like you know keychains and lighters and fucking <laughs> Q-tips and like anytime. <laughs> Somebody has a brain fart and they're like, oh, I want to order this. You know, we live in the goddamn city. I'm, I'm fucking two blocks away from a CVS. Anything I need, I walk over there and yeah, I get but, it. Yeah, but, you know, at least in our you, CVS. You know what I order? You know what I order from Amazon? Up. You know what I what? order from Amazon? What? I order, um, you know what I order online? I order Nespresso stuff because you can only get it from Nespresso. And I order uh, maybe like one or two of the the supplements that I take for like after jujitsu, like those things like amino acids, just because I can't get them anywhere else. They're like specific uh, brands, but th- that's, that's it. I'm just not, dude, I'm not an online shopper. Like, and I, I well, I, I can tell you two things for like day to day household items, and you know, l- 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 let like, me just say one more thing. And then you can, yeah. you can t- tell me about your day to day household items. I go to whole foods all the time, right? There's a whole yeah. foods close to me and I like whole foods. It's yeah. expensive, but I, I like their food. And if you like to eat like decent food, that's a great place to go. You yeah. know, I, I considered getting a prime subscription because I thought there was, 
I thought you got a blanket discount as a Prime member at Whole Foods. I thought maybe you get like 10% off each order or something, which, you know, for me, that would add up because I'm spending a couple hundred dollars there every couple weeks. You know, over the course of the year, the membership pays for itself. They don't. They put like two things on special every week for Prime members. This week I looked, it was like, I don't know, you know, ground beef, something I don't even eat and like laundry detergent or something. And that's it. And you get the two little specials. So you got to like, so basically whatever shit they need to move out of inventory, they put it on a discount and you get it. You know, if they offered you some kind of, like I said, like even just 2%, Target does like 2% with their card, whatever it is, something like that. I'd be, oh, okay, maybe. But for me, there's no reason. In- and I'm not going to get Prime so I can watch the Jaguars and the Bears in <laughs> London on Saturday morning. Like, it's just, <laughs> I, I would love to watch the game. I love football. But, like, it's just, it's the principle at that point. Because I can't, you know, then, then you got 20 fucking streaming things at $20 a month, and all of a sudden your cable bill is $400 fucking dollars a month. It's it's lunacy. Well, and then I got I, you saying, oh, you only have Netflix and, and <laughs> fucking Peacock? Like, well, so first of all, so I, I you know, Prime I have because I have Prime shipping. By the way, the Amazon branded credit card, where I think it's a co-brand with Chase, um, if they still have the deal, it's 5% off everything you order on Amazon, no matter what it is, 5% off. It's really a pretty amazing deal. And and Walmart.com has the same deal, 5% off there. So on all these household goods, I pull up both websites and who's ever got it cheaper, whatever, the toilet paper, the cereal, whatever, I order, I order it from there. And, um, and it's cheaper. It's much cheaper than in a Manhattan, uh, either grocery store or, right. or pharmacy. And the other thing is you go into the fucking CVS here, you mentioned CVS, Everything's locked up behind, yeah. you know, behind the glass cases. So I'm going to sit there and wait for somebody to unlock the fucking Sensodyne. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so, you know, that's why I order it. I just don't want to deal with that shit because we have a bunch of morons running the state. You know, the moron, this guy, his name is Heasty. He's like the head of the, the state assembly or whatever. He's the most powerful guy. They've been begging him, the retailers, please put some, put some real penalties in for shoplifting. He goes, I don't believe any crime can be decreased by increasing the penalty. I, I mean, that's the fucking moron running the state yeah. with the governor who's a total coward. That 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 chick is like Hoshel. She's like afraid of the of the crazy leftists. So, you know, it's just this is a horrible place. I like they kicked her out of that cop's funeral. I saw that. I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you saw that. I mean, fucking you know, turn around, get back in the car and leave. You know, like, I live in New York. What because... a fucking like what a terrible token embarrassing humiliating gesture to show up at that guy's funeral i mean it's just yeah and and this thing with the shoplifting you know i said it a million times on this podcast i'll say it again it's never a problem until it shows up at one of these guys front doors if this guy fucking hinkle or whatever the hell his name is that you're talking about if somebody whatever who cares if somebody (laughs) showed up at his house and started rooting through his refrigerator and eating his fucking you know relish and taking his taking his ice cream all of a sudden it would be where are the police and this always happens this always happens when these motherfuckers show up at somebody's house it's always like oh where's the police you know i remember uh, there was some video i posted uh a couple of uh weeks ago uh of some lady in some liberal city that something crazy was happening oh it was like on the subway or something somebody was losing their shit and some like you know some lady in the middle of manhattan's like where are the police it's like (laughs) you fucking idiots don't want the police around you know, you voted in the people that want to take the police off well, the street. Uh, Where are the let, police? A, cu- a couple of things. Well, first of all, you're the old, you know, the old expression, a, a conservative is a liberal who's been mugged. You know that, right? Yeah, no, um, but that makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, so the thing is, for sure, New York is just Democrats. I mean, at least New York City. And so what matters is the primary and nobody shows up to vote in the primary. Like these neighborhoods where you have the most radical leftists representing them, those people want more cops, but they don't show up. It's not that they voted for the these morons like AOC or whatever, Heasty. It's just they don't show up to vote at all. And this is what they get. And it's the crazies who show up to vote to put, to put these people, these people win the primary. And then, you know, no one has a chance against them in the general election. So... I don't know. It's her. I stay in New York because, well, we're we're tied here for my my girlfriend's work. I could do this 
I could bullshit with you on the phone for three hours from anywhere. Um, but, but the other thing is I do really love like, you know, it's a 10 minute walk for me to the Met Museum on a Saturday morning. I mean, there's so much stuff I can do. The cultural stuff I really like that you really can't do anywhere else. So, you know, I just paid yeah, a, a And there's like one of every shop there and like seven new restaurants a day open that so you, you if you wanted to that you could go to a new restaurant every day for the rest of your life, which you I could, think could except except restaurants have gotten so obscenely expensive. I mean, even my diner, I I get delivery from my local diner like probably four or five times a week, you know? And it's like, you know, it used to be like a, a turkey burger used to be 10.95. That's now $16. It's like Every single menu item in New York City restaurants is up 50% since COVID. It's it's just it's insane. You you can't get out of a you can't get out of a diner anymore for less than $50 a person. It just it's ridiculous. Well, so. maybe you should go up to Montreal and visit my favorite diner. It's called Bobien Novo System. It's uh I'd, I'd be interested to see what the prices are up there, but the exchange rate's really good. So I You think... have a favorite diner in Montreal? Yeah, How the fuck yeah. That? How does that happen? Well, I spent a lot of time in Montreal. And so, you know, eventually. Well, how did you wind up spending a lot of time in Montreal? I just, I just started, I went up there for the first time in like the 2010s uh, yeah. at some point for like a New Year's Eve. Had a great time. Met a woman, you know, went back a couple of times to, you know, date and socialize. And then uh, when that relationship so you have, ended. you have a girlfriend up there? Oh, the relationship ended. Okay. Yeah, when it ended, I just kept going back up because I really liked the city, you know. It's just Montreal is a great example of like, if you're going to be obscene with taxes, like at least make the city look good. Like yeah. Montreal's Metro is fucking a masterpiece. I am obsessed with their Metro system. Like I, it is just absolutely beautiful. The city is beautiful. It really is. And it's clean and people are fucking nice. And like they huh. stop at street signs when they're supposed to, and they give way to one another. And like, you know, now I know Quebec is so hyper liberal and uh, extremely expensive, <clears throat> but having said that, at least that, you know, 65% people are paying in taxes appear to be going, you know, it's like, is that what they pay? It's, it's ridiculous. I don't know if it's 65%, but it's, oh. it's obscene. It's, it's more than New York, I think. Wow. And so, you know, then when I'm in Philly and, or you're in New York and you're paying these exorbitant taxes and you look around and all you can see is some guy shitting in a bag. You're just like, <laughs> you know, like, where's the tax going? The, I, I, I can't even bag. get a dude. I, I can't even ride the fucking subway in Philadelphia. Like, I will and I do, but like I really I don't like it and it's not because I'm scared and it's not because I can't, you know, handle my own business or mind my own business because I can. I'm 62, 200. I'm not worried about that. It's just disgusting, dude. It fucking stinks. It looks like shit. There's fucking drug paraphernalia all over the place. It's just dude, it is chaos. Our fucking subway system is absolute chaos in Philadelphia. So I just wonder like you know, where's the fucking money going? And it's crazy. And then I see, like, you know, these, like, cute little, like, nurses going to Jefferson and Penn, like, riding by themselves. I'm like, oh, my God. You know, if that was my daughter, I would be – I'd be really, really nervous. And, yeah. The money goes The money goes to, uh, to union contracts. That's where it goes to. Really fat union contracts probably is where it goes and just gets wasted. I mean, the MTA here is – look, I mean, I have to say – And the fucking, you know, every day there's a new parade for some new liberal cause going through the city as well. And that's the other yeah. thing. With a big float yeah. and, you know, drag did, queens. Did you, get the... rid of your, did you get rid of your um, your your crazy leftist DA? I forget. Was he recalled or fired? No, or something? no he's still here. He's still there. Yeah. Okay. We yeah. got rid of our mayor. Ah. Uh. So our new mayor, Sherelle Parker, actually, I mean, it was always going to be a Democrat yeah. that, that got elected, but uh, she's a little bit more uh, she's a little bit more into law and order, and she's a little bit closer with the police department than uh, Mayor Kenny. I mean, Kenny was just pretty much despised by everybody in law enforcement, and from what I understand, Parker has a little bit better of a line of communication. Um, <clears throat> the Republican, this guy David O, I had him on my podcast, actually trains at the same uh jiu-jitsu gym that i go to super nice guy uh you know 
didn't even come close. And he, he, ran, he ran a pretty good campaign. I thought that like his shit was everywhere. He had a ton of advertisements. Ton of uh, he had the support of Chinatown. He was huge in Chinatown because he's uh, I think he's Korean, but uh, <clears throat> had a big following there in an area that normally would have gotten a lot of Democratic votes. But Parker just blew him out of the water. The the, the one win for Philly was that Parker in the spectrum of democratic candidates that ran in the primary was the the furthest to the center than the rest of them i mean the 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 rest of them were absolutely batshit insane and so you know that's what we had here in new york with adams he was basically the centrist right democrat who who ran and won and uh it's hard to believe that you know in the 1990s rudy giuliani before he went crazy won the mayor won the mayoralty as a Republican two yeah. terms in a row. I mean, but that's how bad New York was. I mean, crime was so bad. Everything was so out of control that, I mean, they were close elections, but he won as a Republican. And then Bloomberg, who won three terms, he ran as a Republican his first term and he won. It was like shocking that we actually elected a Republican. Now it's like it's like unfathomable because people are so knee-jerk, they won't even think about the candidate. You got Republicans who run here, they're like pro-choice. You know, they're they're like liberal Republicans and they still, you know, they don't have a fucking chance. So, yeah. yeah. Anyways, the world's going to hell, but <laughs> we're both alive and, and kicking one yep. more day. And uh, I don't know, man, I just feel like it could be any day that I'm going to wake up and I'm going to check the news and something will have broken in in the financial world or in the world in general, you know, sadly. Well, of course, the market, then the, then you got to start, if you're short or whatever, then you got to start worrying about the Fed put. Something breaks, what does the Fed do? Now, if, we've, if something breaks and we've got 3.8% core inflation – you know, they're they're kind of fucked, but that doesn't mean they won't step in anyway and worry about the inflation later. Right. I mean, these said I mean, you know, it was the big expression in like 2008, you know, kicking the can down the road. These guys are are total can kickers. All these central bankers are, you know, I said about Musk when um, when the stock was tanking and he uh, he all of a sudden tweets about the uh, robo I said he's I said, all these guys used to kick the can down the road. He, he kicks the scam down the road. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but that's that's really what it is. That's like I said before, didn't I say it's like Musk quantitative easing? You know, <laughs> you said that every that. every time you do it, the fucking lie has to get bigger, and you keep going and going and going that's until something big. breaks in a big way. Instead of just saying, "Hey, you know, I fucked up, and we need we need a year to reorganize the business and get back on track," or you know, "Hey, we got to take the recession here. It's going to suck for a year, but then things will get better." Well, the problem is then he'd essentially been saying, well, he'd, he'd essentially have to say. All we are is a car company, and it gets re-rated down 90%. It's going to happen anyway. It's just happening g- very gradually. It, it, not that great. It's pretty fairly slowly. Let's put it that way, you know. But it's going to happen. I mean, my, my cover point, I'm short a lot of Tesla. And my ultimate cover point, at least, you know, for, for the call it the core position, is like in the 20s per share. And that's probably generous, you know. Yeah, well, if it goes to 20, it's probably going to zero. No, not necessarily. No. If it went to if it went to twenty, it would have a market cap of uh, sixty four billion dollars. Yeah, but right? gonna, yeah, but then they'll, they'll be selling equity at that price, right? Well, no, you know, maybe maybe it's at sixty four billion dollars, and you know, they whatever. Maybe it's maybe they make uh, you know maybe they can get this business to make you know two fifty a share, right, and okay. it's you know, I mean, it's it's. It, they don't have to go bankrupt now. Of course, you know, unless there's something behind the curtain that's that's particularly bad. But you know, sixty-four billion dollars. Hang on, I'm just pulling up GM. Uh, GM is fifty billion dollars, right? Right. So, you know, and and GM is much bigger than Tesla, and Tesla is no longer growing. And what's you know, Tesla bringing to the table that GM isn't? That's the key well, question, right? Right now, nothing anymore. Just a guy, a guy in a robot suit. <laughs> I mean, you know, so I'm I'm looking here like. Uh, here, so Ford. What's Ford's market? Ford is uh, is um, also like fifty two billion dollars. Right. So the the question like is, what's Tesla doing that these two aren't? Where's the well, disruption? Well, nothing anymore. Right. Nothing. So that's that is the point. I mean, yeah. So that that's but that's why I'm saying it's 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 not at all unfathomable that Tesla winds up a twenty dollars stock. It would probably still be generous. I mean, if they're selling one point 
7 million cars this year. I think GM sells like 4 million cars. I forget, you know, whatever. So, I, I mean, it's, ridic it's a ridiculous valuation. I mean, they could be $10 stock, but that doesn't mean they have to be bankrupt. They could just, you know, be another slightly profitable auto company, you know? Yep. So, uh, yeah. All right. all right, Spiegel. Appreciate your time, brother. It was good. This was awesome. Good. This was a lot of fun. Always look forward to it. And yeah, next time you're in New York, we're, we can... We, you can drink your way through my refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. But funny is I have all these different beers. I put one of each in the fridge, and all the rest of them are in boxes under the table here. Because otherwise, I could fill the fridge with them, and and the girlfriend would throw me out of the fucking place. When so I, when I pass out on the uh, on the floor <laughs> in front of the refrigerator, you but, take that photo and put it out on Twitter. <laughs> uh, yeah. But you're very you're guess very who's, well. Guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> sample them so. All right, man. Thank Good you. shit. All right, Mark. Talk to you soon, buddy. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. That was the one, the only Mr. Mark Spiegel. Good to have him back on the podcast. He, uh, good buddy of mine now. He's been coming on for quite a while. And, uh, hey, the tide could be turning, Mark, on the old Tesla bet. You never know. It's been many, many difficult years <laughs> of uh, getting it wrong and just eating large quantities of shit in general. And it looks like the tide could be turning. And certainly I agree with Mark as well. So, all right, fools. Got a bunch of uh, great guest ideas coming up. If you uh, enjoy the podcast, check out my sponsors over at JM Bullion. Uh, email Laura at jmbullion.com. Check out the Swan app if you're interested in Bitcoin. That link, $10 free, is in my podcast description. And shout my buddy George Gammon over at Rebel Capitalist Pro out. Ask him for a free trial. Tell him QTR sent you. All right, fools. I'm out of here for now. Peace.